Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to rank the ETXs. Which one's going to wind up at number one? Let's find out. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. I put the ETXs into four categories. The Maxitobs are going to take up three of them. There's the 90, the 105, and the 125. And the refractors, I'm going to lump those together into one category. That's the 60, the 70, and the 80, because I find that they tend to perform pretty similarly. So I'm just going to count the refractors as one category. So let's find out and let's get started. So as those of you who have followed me for the past 25 years or so know, ETX is not my favorite telescope. There's a lot of plastic here, and I find they don't hold very well up in long-term use. But the ETX is so important, so iconic in our hobby, one of the best-selling telescope lines in all of history. The ETX cannot be ignored. So in the beginning, there was this, the Questar. When I was growing up, the only thing I knew about a Questar is that I couldn't afford one. So Meade shocked the world in 1996 by producing a Questar clone for $495, a fraction of the cost of a Questar. And they shocked the world even more four years later, around the year 2000, by introducing a computer-controlled ETX for $495. Amazing! Okay, so what's my beef with the ETX? What I find is the optics on the ETX are usually fine. The problem with this telescope is usually not the optics, it's all the stuff around the optics. In fact, the optical tube itself is usually okay. The biggest problem you're going to find and the biggest complaint is image shift. While you're focusing, the image dances around, it can get hard to draw a fine focus. The Finder also comes under some criticism. It's an 8x21. They've played with this formula a little bit, right angle straight through, but the magnification is too high, the aperture is too low, it's mounted too close to the optical tube itself, so you hit your nose or your head when you're trying to look through it, and it's held on by six of the smallest nylon screws that I think I've ever seen. You can bump those things off. Missing screw heads on those nylon screws are almost a cliché with an ETX. Some people have reported problems with this flip mirror assembly in the back here. It flips between the, the eyepiece port and out the back. I've never had a problem with that, but some people say it doesn't always return to the same position. Also, there is a secondary baffle on the Illumini secondary spot here. It's held on by a piece of double-sided ring tape. And the problem is, over time, the adhesive on that tape can fail, and the baffle can either fall off or start drifting down into the spot on the secondary mirror. I have not had many problems with that, but some people don't like the possibility of that happening. And what you can do, this plate here comes off. You can just reach in there and yank that thing out. I know some people who do that. But overall, the optical tube is pretty solid, pretty steady. The drive base, however, does garner a lot of complaints. And the biggest complaint you're going to hear, especially on these early non-computerized models, is the hysteresis. That's the backlash. In other words, when you center an object, you tighten down on this screw here. There's a little ball head screw here. And what'll happen is by the time the drive kicks in, the object will have moved out of the field of view entirely. So people will say, well, all you have to do is take the object and put it at the other edge of the field and quickly tighten down on the ball head. And then hopefully by the time the drive kicks in, the object will be in the center of the field of view. Yeah, I don't know if I feel I should have to do that. So in later versions, they did change that little screw to a bat wing style handle as shown here. That generates a lot more torque and it does help. I have had also people tell me that on this, there is a declination lock here. This is a metal screw, and all this does is clamp two pieces of plastic together. I haven't had this happen to me, but people have complained to me that in cold weather, you can snap off the plastic if you're not careful. So on these early models, the non-computerized ones, even when everything's working perfectly, I find they're frustrating to use. In 2000, they came out with the ETX AutoStar controller 
model, and I think it's a big improvement. Now, there are some drawbacks here. You are going to have to learn an operating system, and it, on top of everything else you have to learn, it can be overwhelming. But overall, not having to deal with the frustrations of having to move this thing manually, I think it's an improvement. So on this, if you want to see this move, um, see it, it thinks it's going to Alberio right now. So the biggest complaint you're going to see about this go-to system, okay, you, that's enough of that. So the biggest complaint you're going to hear with any inexpensive go-to system is pointing accuracy. So in other words, if you dial up an object, it may not appear in the center of the eyepiece view all the time. It may be off to the side, it may be to the edge, and in some cases it may be outside the field of view which may require you to take this and pan around. So, uh, you know, advanced astronomers know that these things happen, but beginners are very often confused. And I think the problem is for a beginner, you're, again, you're overwhelmed with all the stuff you have to learn here. When it doesn't find the target, beginners don't know if they did something wrong or if it's the telescope. And if this kind of thing happens repeatedly, it can pick, take people out of the hobby and we don't want that happening. So again, on these ETX-90s, optical tubes, good. Drive base, yeah, I'm not so sure. So what happens a lot is people will just uh, liberate the optical tube from the drive base. It's not hard to do. There's a couple of screws here you have to loosen, and they'll just uh, use it like this. I put this on a Vixen-compatible plate at the bottom, and I'll put it on a conventional German equatorial mount, and I find it's a lot easier. Again, the optics on these are usually pretty good. These are fun for kids, and at star parties, I'll show them the moon and Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, you know, once you get down below those three objects, things start getting a little bit less fun. But for those three objects, terrific, and it's also good for webcam lunar planetary imaging if you want to dip your toe into that realm. So at number three, we have the refractors, 60, 70, and 80 millimeters. The 60 and the 70 appeared in the catalog first. This is a 60. Then it was just the 70 for a while, and then after that it was just the 80 until the end of its production run. So I'll get the bad news out of the way first. The weak part of the refractors is the optics. Unlike the Maxitovs where the optics were the strength, these are cheap, fast acromats, and they've got false color, and they're not sharp, and they're not really all that great. They don't hold up under high power, but that's okay given the intended use for these things. Another thing is the internal focuser, which some people find a little odd. You see nothing moves in here, it's all internal. The reason they had to do that is because if, if there was a conventional focuser that moved the eyepiece out the back, when you're pointed at the zenith like this, it could create a situation where it doesn't clear the drive base. So that's good and it's a nice clean design, but if it fails, you, you might have some issues getting that thing fixed. Also, it came with a really cheap tripod. It is too lightweight, I think, for its own good. If you do the align and then you bump into it, you're going to have to do the alignment again. This has happened at least once to every ETX refractor owner that I've ever known. Also, they've downgraded the eyepiece from the super plossils to these generic eyepieces. I wouldn't worry about that too much. It's fine, given the intended use for this telescope. So one thing I do want to point out is the refractors have a different auto star. You'll notice there is no numeric keypad on the refractor auto star. This might not seem like a big deal at first, but if you're dialing up an object that's got a complicated number on it, you're going to be pushing those arrow keys a lot. So again, there's a lot of plastic on this thing. You'll see on this one, the battery door and the battery holder have both failed and the owner has rigged some sort of uh, power pole type arrangement here so he can get power to the telescope. Astrophotography? You're kidding, right? So I did figure out a way to get the webcam lunar planetary imager in there, and I did get this image of the moon. So again, in summary, not a serious telescope, but not an expensive one, and it's easy to use, and I find it's a very friendly way to get into the hobby. Use it up, learn everything you can from it, and then figure out if you want to move on. 
And at number two, we have ETX 105. You know, a lot of the comments I made about the ETX 90 do apply to the 105 and the 125. In fact, you could actually make the argument that because of the longer focal lengths of the larger models, the AutoStar is actually going to have a harder time coping with things because it has to be that much more accurate. It thinks it's going to Vega. But anyhow, okay, that's enough of that for you. So why do I rank the 105 higher than the 90? One reason and one reason only, it is comparatively rare. If there's such a thing as a collectible ETX, this is it. I know it seems like an oxymoron. The ETX is one of the best selling telescopes lines of all time, but the 105 was only in the catalog for a couple of years. It kind of popped in and out of the catalog around the year 2000 and then you didn't see it anymore. I've seen hundreds of ETX 90s. I think I've seen maybe a handful of these in my entire life. Again, these telescopes are pretty good for webcam lunar planetary imaging. The other night I went out and I got these images of the moon. Not too bad. Okay, so a word about these Mead ETX tripods. I do not view the tripods as being optional. You do need these things. And the problem is the hole spacing for the threads on the bottom of the scope are spread far apart and they don't match anything that you probably have. It has to be that way to accommodate the battery door. So you might be able to rig something or put a plate underneath it or machine something, but if you're not able or willing to do that, you are going to meet these tripods. There were at least two of these that were fairly common, the number 883 and the number 884. If you do get them used, it's a plus if you get the tripod bag. So, I want to tell you my favorite Mead ETX tripod story. So back in the year 2000, when the 90 millimeter computer controlled telescopes first hit the market, again, there was a frenzy around these things. I mean, people were scalping these things. So it was right around the time, you know, year 2000, when the internet started to become a part of our daily lives. And for the first time, there were forums and news groups and emails. And when word got out, well, Let's just say after a while, people weren't scalping them anymore. But anyway, in the early days of the frenzy of this, I was in a telescope shop, and remember those? And a customer walked in and he was just frantic to get one of these new ETXs. He had read some rave review online or someplace and he just had to have one. So the clerk behind the counter said, well, you're lucky because these are in high demand right now. I do have one in stock. He put it on the counter and the customer took out his wallet to pay for it. And the clerk said, um, well, by the way, um, the AutoStar controller is separate. You have to pay an extra $149 for that. At the time, they were not bundling everything together. You had to pay extra for the AutoStar. And if you want to use the computer, then you need it. So the customer was like, well, okay, I'll get that. And the, the clerk said, he's just doing his job. He says, well, you know what? The, the tripod is not a standard mount. You, you kind of do need the Mead tripod. And at the time, I think that was something around $119 and, and he bought that too. So I was listening to the whole exchange from around the corner and it was fascinating and you know, a little bit sad to watch what happened. I mean, the guy walked in the store and his mood, you know, he went from here you know, to here uh, to here. So I always wondered what happened to that guy. Okay, and finally at number one, by attrition, we have ETX-125. So I'll give you, give you a couple of cautions about these. Number one, the early versions were not very good. They had some quality control issues. You can tell if you have an early version, if you have a fork mounted unit like this one, what you do is you pull off this cover here, and I'll put a picture up here. The early versions had a plastic bushing bearing there. They later did refresh that to a brass one, and the later versions obviously are a lot better. The second thing is, at 1900 millimeters, these are getting up there for a auto star to handle. It's almost the focal length of an 8-inch McCassie grain, if you think about it. And there's a reason why Mead puts their 8-inch McCassie grains 2000 millimeter focal length on LX90s and LX200s. Those are just much better systems. Having said that, these optical tubes are pretty good. 
So you'll notice I have a different visual back on here. I had a friend of mine, he's a Harvard professor, so he got this right. He pulled off the stock plastic visual back and made this sort of bracket here that holds a William Optics Crayford style focuser. So you can actually find focus with the Crayford focuser and, fo and coarse focus with the stock focuser. So if you don't have a friend who's a Harvard professor, you have options. Weget Optical, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, does make replacement visual backs for the 90, the 105, and the 125. It's a pretty simple piece of machined aluminum, but it works very well, and I have friends who use these things, and they like them a lot. One caution about the Weget visual back is you will lose the mounting foot, the integral foot that comes with the standard visual back. So you are gonna have to come up with another solution involving mounting rings. Another amusing thing about the Wagit backs is if you look at the pricing, the back for the 125 costs $125, the one for the 105 costs $105, and the one for the 90 costs $90. One additional caution, the 90 millimeter version works on all of the ETX 90s except for that last Observer series where they did the redesign. So again, other than that, Optically, these are fine. I use this on my AVX mount, and for general purpose viewing, it's fine. I like it a lot on the moon. It's great on Saturn and Jupiter, and I'll even do some deep sky viewing with it as well. So there you have it, folks, a look at one of the most iconic telescopes ever made, the Mead ETX. I look forward to hearing your comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.